The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. The votes are in or almost in, but how many of them actually count? How often has your vote made a difference? If you're Labour and you live in a true blue constituency, what's the point in making your mark on the ballot paper? The first past the post system was designed for when you elected the person to represent your town, not the party. But how many of us even know who our MP is? In Europe, it's only us and Belarus who stick to this way of voting. So is it time to change to a proportional system? So that we are all represented. The why curve. Now, of course, many people will be listening to this after the election results are out, but we are recording and publishing, actually. uh, Well, we're publishing on the day of the election when people are going out to vote. so we don't know. So we've never had, well, I think, uh, and we can ask our guest on this, I think Mm. 1931, when we elected the national Mm. government, that was actually the last time Mm. when people voted for a government that was a majority government. It's always been less. The party has always got less than 50% of the vote. Oh, right. So straight away, ever since then, the party that's elected is the party that most people didn't want. Which is interesting, isn't it? So I, is that a problem? I <laughs> or, or didn't say they did want? Because, I mean, don't forget, you've got mm. an awful lot of people who don't vote anyway Yeah. Uh, as well. But, yeah, I mean, is this issue of we are in a democracy once every five years at least, but most of us, me included up to this point, have never really lived anywhere where the person supposedly representing me was mm. in any sense in line with my views. Yeah. And, 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 of course, this idea of the, you know, the Westminster system where you're voting for somebody who's representing your local area. I mean, that is important, isn't it? And that's why, because you do want somebody who represents your local area. But there mm. again, are they really doing that? I mean, and, is that what, who is, knows? I mean, how many people, if you stop ministry, would even know who their MP was? Mm. That's the thing. Yeah. And, and, and so our whole idea of the system, yes, you do need representation for sure. But I mean, maybe something that we'll talk about this, but multi-member constituencies, bigger constituencies, yeah. but where at least, you know, you have three people saying there's a fair chance that one of them might actually be your political Yeah, persuasion. exactly. Yeah, but broaden the area rather than local yeah. towns. Because we've got local councils, yes. you know, and so for being represented on local issues like yeah. who's fixing the potholes, mm. you vote on that. You don't need that level to be brought up to Westminster. So maybe the system... Is just a bit out of date. And you think the British <laughs> political system? No. But how do you change it? That's the problem because it is a you know it's well, almost like a constitutional change. And the big point, which I'm sure we will hear or certainly we'll talk about, is that the, it does provide uh, a kind of majority. I mean, you you know maybe an unfair one. Yeah. But really the argument unfair. is we've had strong governments. Well, we kind of haven't if you look over the past few years. Mm. But strong government, which uh, you know those terrible people on the continent never had. Exactly. Well, joining us now is someone who really knows uh, about all this, and that's Dr. Heinz Brand. Brandenburg, Senior Lecturer in Politics at the University of Strathclyde, also co-author of The Declining Representativeness of British Politics and Why It Matters. Heinz, thanks for being with us. I suppose thanks the, for having me. Thank, I, I suppose <laughs> the, the key point in this is, is the system really actually not democratic? I, I wouldn't go that far that it's not democratic. Um, I mean, it, it's... Um, and, and a lot of people tend to to argue that that of course it, it makes it easier to, for for governments to be formed and and you avoid situations like you have in many countries with very very proportional systems that that you need uh, long coalition formation processes and I mean currently in the Netherlands they are there over half a year since the election and still haven't formed a government and and they have records of of taking about a year or so to do it. So, so you don't have these problems. I mean, in, in the UK, I remember in 2010 with the coalition government, there was already upheaval because it took four days to form a government. Um, so normally you have it within a day and, and it makes easy to, to form governments and, and for governments, uh, which most, most people also don't know, there, there's research which show that, that under first past the post, you, you have governments do fulf- are fulfilling more of their their pledges, their election manifesto pledges and promises than than in coalition governments where where it's more about compromising. So so there are certainly advantages to it. And I guess that's the point, isn't it? That because very often people say, well, you know, the, the having some form of proportional representation is m- a much fairer approach than uh, having a first past the post system but if you've got say 45 percent and 55 percent and you get some sort of coalition formed or you know you've got two representatives there in in parliament who are almost equal in number you, you're not actually going to get anything done are you they're just going to block each other for for five years it's just going to be completely ineffective government well it depends um it depends how how coalitions work um and they can work back better, and they can work. They can be more difficult. 
Um, and and I think the more, f I mean, we see fragmentation with, with people choosing various different political parties in, in all countries, just like you see in, in Britain. I just looked at the numbers this morning and this is probably going to be the most fragmented vote that, that the British election has ever seen. Where you have well, you you still have one forty percent party, but but otherwise you you have a number of twenty and and fifteen percent and twelve percent parties and so on. So a lot of people have different preferences, and and that first past the post is particularly bad at representing that. Yeah, so that's so. I mean, we don't, of course, you know, there'll be people listening to this podcast after the results are out, so we've got to be careful about making ourselves seem foolish by quoting statistics that might be completely disproven. But I'm looking at the electoral calculus, which shows they, they've been predicting how many seats people are going to get based on the number of votes. So they're predicting Labour's going to get 470 seats. That's 72% of the seats with only 40% of the votes. So a, a massive majority for seats, but still a minority of votes. I mean, if it was proportional representation, they'd only get 260 seats. The Conservatives would have 130 seats. And here's the rub reform which are predicted to only get seven seats, would get 110 seats by by that system. So I'm sure a lot of reform voters, if they get a poor showing in the number of seats, are going to be looking and saying, well, how how is that fair? Because we have, you know, claimed such a high proportion of the total number of votes. Yes, and I mean, they, they've kind of experienced that before in 2015 when it was UKIP. And and they they basically didn't win any seats. They won the one seat that that's from, from that defected Tory who... Who was re-elected, but but otherwise they didn't get anything for thirteen point eight percent of of the vote, um, and and I mean Farage has been one of those who who has been uh, arguing for proportional representation because he's always led parties that um, that basically don't have a chance. I mean the 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 Lib Dems are much further. The, the Lib Dems actually will will probably have their their mo most proportional results ever. Because they they are much more concentrated in their vote and and much more targeted, they benefit now from tactical voting, so they could actually uh, get their their best ever result in terms of seats on one of their worst ever results in terms of vote share. Well, that's so that, that in a sense is ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, in, going back to my first point about is this really democratic? It is an argument for saying. If, if it's only circumstances that lend representation in the end, where your vote happens to be, whether it's concentrated or not. And I I don't think, I, I, in my entire history of voting, I've ever actually been a constituency where I had political agreement with the person who was elected to represent me. So in a sense, my vote in all those elections has never counted. I mean, that can't be democratic, can it? No, it's very problematic that uh, usually also Britain is a country um, that... Uh, has a lot of very, very safe seats, safe Labour seats, safe Conservative seats, where you have, um, they, they win 60, 70% of, of the vote, uh, which is only broken when, when you have a massive landslide like now and, and a party collapsing like the Conservatives, and suddenly they could lose seats where they previously won 60% of the vote share. But, but in a normal election that's a bit closer between Labour and the Conservatives, you basically have <clears throat> the, the majority of seats uh, where there's no contest and and voters in in these constituencies are not really participating in any other form than than i don't know sort of a, an expressive form okay they 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 register their their vote preference but but it's pre-decided in their constituency who's going to win anyway so it's not really democratic That's, is it? i mean that, that at the basic level the people, individual people, are not able to express their views in a way that means and anything. And the problem with all of this is that it's because it's based on relatively small constituencies, isn't it? Because the idea is you want your local representative in, in, in yeah. Westminster. But is that a bit old-fashioned? Just before you came on, Hans, we were talking about uh, one of the ideas which we didn't really explore was the idea that maybe rather than smaller constituencies... We had a, you know, a bit like Scotland, really, where you had a bit more of a proportional representation type approach for a larger region. So you have your uh, electoral region and your constituency. So you still vote for constituency member, but you might have five or six members for a larger area, which might be the northwest of England, for example. So you get almost a mix of, of, of both systems. That seems like a, a more realistic way of representing the variety of views in a particular region, because the local area... I mean, we've got local councils, we've got local forms of, of government. Do we really need that localness 
to that degree represented in Westminster? Um, well, for, for me, as a German who grew up in a federal system where, where you have different levels of government at state level and then uh, also relatively strong local government, uh, th this whole idea that you need constituency representation at, at national level um, was always a bit bit alien to me. Um, but clearly it, it matters. And, and I mean, that's why you have a place like Scotland or, or as well New Zealand moving to, to a mixed system um, where, where you combine um, party representation with, with constituency representation. And actually, I, I think the, the, the system in New Zealand is, is better than, than the system in, in Scotland or Wales. How does it work in New Zealand, just, just for information? Well, basically, in, in New Zealand, you, you uh, have a total of 122 seats or so in Parliament. 71 of them are constituencies, just normal, normal first-past-the-post elections. And then there's another 51 seats, which, which are list seats. And they have one national na nationwide list for all of New Zealand, which, which is the, the benefit compared to, to Scotland with the, the eight regions. So, so this will be lists by each party and they would then get seats in proportion to that? Yeah, you basically have two votes. Um, so you have a constituency vote and you have a party vote. And basically the, the constituencies that a party wins are then being taken as, as part of their total allocation of seats, which is based on, on their party vote. Um, and that you, that that works quite well. You 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 can have some so-called overhang seats where a party wins more constituencies than um, than it actually is is entitled to seats overall. And and I calculated that through yesterday or so for for what it would mean for this election in the UK if if you had that Labour given if if they win something like four hundred and seventy seats or so, um, even if if you would say divide Britain in just 400 constituencies, so a bit larger than they are now, and then you would have 250 uh, list seats, which would be just about the same um, uh, same system as, as in New Zealand, then Labour would win something between 50 and 80 overhang seats. So, so they would have more seats than would be their proportional share. So, so you would have a bit of a a uh, bit of a lopsided result, but not in the but sense... But you'd have a very strong government, wouldn't you? Because one party would dominate everything. N no, but but Labour would not be able to to win a majority of, of seats. They they would win, say, if you had 400 seats, they would win something like 280 of, of the constituencies, but they wouldn't get any list seats in addition. So they would have 280 out of the 650 seats. They would be by far the largest party, but they would need a coalition partner. Only they could choose between either the Greens or the, the Lib Dems as their uh, coalition partners, which would all both make possible partners. Whereas if you had a perfectly proportional uh, system, then Labour would most likely need two coalition partners. It, it could just about... Uh, be enough with with just the, the with just one of them, depending on whether Labour actually get over forty percent. You can't it. have too many people in Parliament, obviously in New Zealand, because uh, there's got to be other people left to to do stuff in the in the country. <laughs> but uh, just just over the water mm. in, uh, in Australia, they have a, a country I know well. Uh, the elections there are run on preferences, so. I, in this country, translating for this country, for example, I might say, well, I, I want to vote for the Lib Dems. If the Lib Dems don't win, I want my vote to go to the Labour Party. And if I don't say anything, I just say I want to vote for the Lib Dems. The Lib Dems might decide themselves if we lose a seat we want our votes to go to the Labour mm. Party. So you've got this system of preferences where it sort of filters down. Yeah. I mean, that seems to work fairly well. I'm wondering what the... Uh, I mean, it does mean theoretically, that you could have someone who comes in third, for mm. example, who then gets all the votes filtered through to them and they actually come in first place and the and the, the, the person who got it's the most distortion. votes. So it could be seen as a distortion, but there again, you are taking account of people's second and third choices. Well, and I don't know, is that a more fair system, do you think, uh, Heinz? Not really. I mean, the, the thing is, uh, it, it would probably... If you applied that now from what we know about Lib Dem Green Labour voters or so, they would probably transfer preference between them, the, the three parties, which which would mean that that Labour would would probably win under the alternative vote as many seats as, as they win in, in the Westminster election. 
So they you could possibly more, in fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they could even win more. And, and the Conservatives, I mean, there, there was a referendum about this, of course, in 2011, and, and it, it was defeated also partly because the, the Lib Dems, who, who were the ones who wanted to have a referendum, wanted to have a referendum on something completely different and, and weren't particularly into AV either. So nobody was in favour. And, and, but in, but in, that, in that system, you would see, for example, it would mean that you could vote for the Reform Party and say, and if they don't win, uh, we want it to go to the Tories as our as our next choice. Or yeah, Tories, Tories might mean, get preferences to reform. It might help I mean, Nigel Farage. Yeah, but these are still, I mean, they're, they're in that sense, they are a majoritarian system, not a plurality system, because ultimately each candidate who gets elected uh, has support from a majority. So so a majority had to, them at least somewhere in their preference order. Um, and that you have other systems like the French system with the two round system where people can vote for whoever they want to in the first round. And then the two or three top candidates go through into the second round. But but all of them create the same amount of distortion in the end as first past the post does. So if you have one party dominating an election like Labour does now, they would under all of these systems get a vast majority, which which I think is a problem that that uh, I mean, it would AV would only allow people to to um, express their, their preferences, but they don't get representation for that necessarily. The Greens would not necessarily win any more seats, even though they might have 13, 14% of first preference votes. And, and that might even be more frustrating for people to see, well, this is actually what we wanted and we get none, nothing of it. So, Sir Hines, are you really saying that you know, with all its faults, perhaps, and, and, and I have to say a lot of people listening think, well, this is vastly complicated, whether it's AV or single transferable vote or topping up from party lists. This all seems very complicated, whereas a simple system is perhaps the best and easiest for people to understand, much like the one we have now. But I think isn't the, isn't the French system quite yeah. easy to understand in that you go, I mean, apart from the fact that... Well, you all of these are easy to understand, I think. Uh, mm. I, I actually, I mean, the... Single transferable vote is, is is one of the, the systems I quite like because it, I mean, and, and I mean the, the Irish aren't a million times smarter than other electorates and and they don't have a problem using it and and Scottish people have have adapted to it in local elections as well. It's it still <clears throat> divides the country into relatively uh, not oversized constituencies, but but each constituency has has multiple representatives. So, so explain how that. So the single transferable vote. If I vote, if you get over a quota, you're in. But yeah. If you, uh, yeah. but then any subsequent candidates uh, have got to get over that quota. And, and it's where you put a one, two, three, four, or whatever on the. Yeah. But that's paper. like a that's like a preferences system, then, isn't it? It is a preferential system, and you you can express as uh, you can just give a preference to your top candidate and nothing else, or you can uh, have a, a list of six or seven preferences in there. And then they use it in-, in well, But you're saying, you said to me that that, that, that that system like in Australia distorts democracy. Yeah, but the, but the system in Ireland or, or used also in Northern Ireland, um, it, it, it produces relatively proportional results because you, they are not single member constituencies. So, so you have to, the typical constituencies in Ireland has four or five members. So, so you get four or five uh, representatives of parties elected. Sometimes that can be two from the same party, but but um, more often than not, you, you have three or four different parties represented. So, so you can have a conservative candidate, a Labour candidate, you could have a Green candidate and a Reform candidate all from one constituency. So if we had, I don't know, the northeast of England, for example, mm. if we said, well, OK, let's pull Teesside and Newcastle together and let's give you six representatives in, in Westminster. So those six, uh, one gets over the quota they're in and then the next ones, you basically take the next highest and the next highest, all people choose. No, what, what you basically do is... Um, so you look first at, uh, the, is anybody already over the quota? Is, if, if somebody has uh, enough votes, which is sort of the number of seats plus one, that's, that's what you divide the total votes by. If anybody is over that quota, they get elected and any of their votes over the quota that they had are then reallocated to other candidates. So you look at their second preferences. So if first a Labour candidate gets elected because he... he or she had had over the quota, then you look at what was the second preference. And to those candidates, the, those votes go then. Then you look at who is who is the least, uh, the, the one with the least votes, and they get eliminated. And their votes are reallocated. And then the next one 
who is the least with the least votes and their votes get allocated until someone else gets over the quota. And that takes a number of counts when when these different candidates are being eliminated or elected. And ultimately, you then get your your five or six candidates who, who, who get elected to parliament. And this is in Ireland? This is the system used in Ireland? This is the system used in Ireland. This is the system also used for uh, Stormont elections in Northern Ireland and the system used for local elections in Scotland. And how long does it take to count the votes in Ireland? Do we, it, it, it sounds like well, uh, the average, the average uh, journalist covering elections would have to have a degree in hyper-mathematics to, to try and no, understand not at it. All. Not at all. I mean, the, the thing is that by now they have it all, it, it's, it's, it's basically electronic now yeah previously yeah, when i lived in ireland in 1990 that's where i did my phd and and that was my first introduction to stv which was a very strange system for me to get my head around back then they they actually had to physically count the votes and then um sort of they they took a random pot of the votes or whatever was less left and 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 allocated them now they basically look at uh, do it electronically. So when a candidate gets eliminated, or or when a candidate, uh, when a candidate gets elected, and and they they basically have the so so there's maybe three thousand votes which need to be reallocated. They basically look at the the overall um, prefer second preferences for that that all the voters of that candidate had, and and proportionally the the votes get then allocated to. Uh, to 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 the second preferences. All right. So, Roger, mean, so I, I have to say, in, listening to this, Heinz, I suppose I can hear people saying, "Well, it does sound quite." I take on board you're saying it isn't complicated; it can be done, and and a lot of people do it. But a lot of people might say, "Well, it's a simple system." Is that actually such a big democratic deficit from everything you've seen, Heinz, in the current system we have in the UK for Westminster elections? That means it really needs to be reformed. Do you, do you think there is an, an actual democratic deficit in that sense? I think there's a deficit in the sense also that that you 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 have these parties like Labour and the Conservatives, which have to be these umbrellas and we've seen over the past few years how dysfunctional the conservatives were as a party we've seen also with the corbyn years and 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 the fallout after um sort of corbyn being kicked out of the party how how awkward partly at the uh, an umbrella the labor party can be and there only have to be these big umbrella parties because of the electoral system because you you have to be this big coalition that needs to win an election and that doesn't mean that government is that governing parties are are more coherent than government coalitions in in other systems necessarily. But, but so in, in Germany, for example, you have massive you know the, the Social Democrats, the Christian Democrats, these big overall covering organisations, and you have a, a different electoral system there. Surely that that's the same problem. But are they less factional? Do they have less factions within them? I think that's what you're saying. Well, they minds that. They don't need to. You could just break break up into different parties. They've been cut down to size, and uh, mm. so so uh, I would say that that the parties internally are are somewhat more coherent than than the their British equivalents. But but by now they are twenty eight, twenty five percent parties, and um, they are no longer these these big catch all parties that they were in in the nineteen eighties and nineties. Yeah. Um, so Jeremy Corbyn might have formed his own party, for example. So Jeremy Corbyn could be a, a ticket alongside Keir Starmer because if we they, had a proportional system. system. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and you 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 might have uh, the the rather than the the purge you saw through the Brexit years in the Conservative Party, they they may have split into into a more uh, one nation Tory party and and a more uh, more right wing party or so, which 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 would compete more directly with with but that's Arabs. what you have in germany with the the afd the alternative for deutschland is is letting is being let into the system in a way that some people might say well that's isn't it better to have the system we have here where effectively maybe unjustly but the political system doesn't have to have parties like reform actually in parliament yeah but does that necessarily help I mean, on on the one end, you 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 have you you have the danger of 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 large parties being um, like you see in the U.S. What happened to the Republican Party with with Donald Trump? They they don't have small extremist parties, but they have have one of the largest one of the two main parties in their country being by by any uh, qualification pretty much a far right party by now. Uh, so so you 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 can have this entryism and and sort of parties being taken over by. Um, uh, 
a, have a quasi hostile takeover of, of a political party. Um, you, I don't think that. I mean, you you also have these these repeated successes for for populist parties being UKIP in 2015, the Brexit Party in the European election 2019. Now. Uh, the Reform Party, and they do have an impact, even though they may not win seats. But you wouldn't have had the the whole Brexit referendum with, without the UKIP vote in twenty fifteen. Um, so it's 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 not necessarily that that Britain is completely safe from populism. And you you had a Tory party which became increasingly more populist under under Boris Johnson then as as a response to to the Brexit yeah. vote. Well, and there it was because not because they thought that they were going to lose uh, to another party, but they were worried that that party was going to uh, whittle away at their votes, which gives Labour a greater chance. Which is hardly democracy, is it? The fact that you know that's what we're seeing now that the Tory party is getting its vote taken away from it because there are people voting reform even though reform are not going to win those seats and labor wins as a result so you've got people who are actually choosing two sides to the right of politics allowing the left side of politics i mean that's electoral deficit you know a, a democratic deficit isn't it yeah just it's, uh, this time it's going the other direction than it did in 2019 when the brexit party mm. stood aside in half of constituencies and and that meant that the conservatives could win a big majority uh, also on just 43% of the vote because the the actual majority vote which was pro remain and 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 um and to the left of the conservatives was split between two or three parties and and the tories would win a lot of seats because of that and yes. and now the 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 rise of reform actually has increased the the disproportionality that that this election will produce by by quite a quite a bit what sort of appetite do you think there is Heinz, though for change uh, in this in our system because i mean we we saw you mentioned the 2011 referendum which was lost um, do you not think, for a start, the party that gets into power on the current system has no incentive to change the system, even though Labour voted at their last conference that they should, or in 2022 they voted that way? And, and do you, you know, is there enough of a public demand, do you think, for any kind of change? Um, I think there could be enough demand, but you would need one of the big parties um, coming across to that. I mean, you have now the Conservatives complaining about this this meaningless concept of of a super majority for for labor um but it does sound a bit like they they are unhappy with uh, with the first past the post system system when it doesn't benefit them yeah, yeah. this is a nice way you just, when you've just won you don't want to change the system that's put you in so look there is a more complicated method this apparently oh, no. is the oh, no. the mathematician's favorite is the condorcet method i'm not sure if you're familiar with this the condorcet so this is where you on the ballot paper you say uh for every party who you prefer given the choice between two so for example you'd say do you prefer tory over labor and uh, now okay well what about tory versus the lib dems what about Labour versus the Lib Dems. And you get asked all of those questions. This is what mathematicians like. So then you're basically saying, yes, well, I like Tory over Labour and Tory over the Lib Dems, but not over reform. For example, I prefer reform over Tory. So reform would get... We more. have few enough people voting already. But Based apparently with this, mathematicians they go near it. love that because, you know, that well, is the most mathematic, mathematically I'll see your condor route. say, and I'll raise it with De Hunt. De Hunt? My favourite De Hunt. You know all about De Hunt, Kainz, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Condorcet thing is, is it's not an electoral system that anyone is proposing. It's it's just that's how you can sort of make a case that, well, any individual may have um, transitive preferences. So so if I prefer Labour over the Conservatives and Labour uh, and Conservatives and, and so on, you, you don't have circular preferences. But societies do have circular preferences which basically is, is one way of mathematically proving that no election result under any electoral system, in many cases, is actually creating an equilibrium. So it's, 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 it's not a meaningful result that would stay the same under every electoral uh, system or so. Um, the De Hunt system is, is basically one of the way, I mean, it's, it's just in, in proportional systems where, where you have to allocate seats, you need to find a way uh, how to allocate them and how to get these quotas according to which seats are allocated to different parties. And some are more proportional and some are less proportional. But it, they, they are they are basically a technical feature of, of an electoral system, which 
which is not, I mean, once you start trying to explain to the general public how these formulas work, you really turn them off any idea of electoral reform because right. it becomes too technical. It should yeah, just and it be sounds complicated. Question. I mean, there, yeah. there should simply be, if if you had a simple question to, to people, do, do you like what, what the UK system is doing, which is basically emphasizing uh, through an election, the the selection of a government over parliamentary representation. Because in terms of parliamentary representation, a large number of people get overlooked by the by the system. But the system is relatively good at, at creating governments and simple governments and, and make it easy for them to form and and to, to do what they want. But it does sound um, like that the best system is, you know, as you're talking about, like we, like we see in Stormont, this idea that you, you, you have a region where you have a number of votes and it's proportional representation almost, isn't it, within, mm-hmm. within that area. And so the the U.S. electoral system is an interesting one, isn't it? Because that's <laughs> that's almost like well, you've got those areas defined because they're the states. But that's I mean, if they were if they were smart, they'd be saying, well, let's do that on a proportional representation basis. But that's they don't, never going to happen. They, no, but the yeah, U.S. system. You, is, you win a state, you win the state. The U.S. system is even worse than here. I mean, it's, essentially, it's the same system. It's, you also have first past the post um, for for parliamentary elections or so at state legislature or, or the House of Representatives or so, but it's it's worse because they 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 have a lot of gerrymandering, which which is sort of setting constituency boundaries in a way that that benefits one party over the other. You you also have a lot of collusion between parties, which means that on average ninety percent of all senators and and representatives get reelected each election. I mean, they're, they're, there's there's all safe seats. You also have in many state elections uncontested seats. So so the Republicans give up on certain seats in California because they can never win one. So they don't even put up a candidate and vice versa in, in, in other states. So so there's even less involvement and less representation. So, and less so Heinz, what you're saying is there is there is really no uh, particular, I mean, there are systems and, and they are better or worse, perhaps, but nothing, I think what you said really represents perhaps what an electorate would want to be, or not in a perfect way. No, nothing can be perfect. I, I, I would just think that there are certain things that um, that British voters do value. So so you can't completely do away with um, constituency representation, I think. Whether that means like the, the solution to that can either be the the New Zealand solution, which which has been a success in New Zealand, and they had a later referendum confirming that they like this electoral system, um, you, voters use their two votes. It's basically the same system as in Germany. The only my experience in Germany and, and looking at German data is Germans don't make any use of this because Germans have no sense of constituency representation, whereas New Zealanders vote very differently for constituency candidates than they vote for parties. Um, and they're quite happy about it. And you have both of both, both the best of both worlds in a way that you do have constituency representation, but you also have very proportional outcomes and and uh, representation in parliament. The alternative, the other way would would be something like like the single transferable vote in Stormont or in Ireland, um, where you would have larger constituencies and and everyone would not just have to be represented by the winner of the constituency, which for the majority is is very often not someone they voted for. But you have four or five representatives of different parties. So everyone in the constituency or the vast majority of people in these larger constituencies would get a representative. So I like that, that one. The one of those, representation in it is. Yeah. And actually, do you know, one of the benefits of that as well, because I think one of the problems we've got in the UK is that obviously so much is concentrated in London and the southeast and people are living up north or in the, in mm. the West Country or other parts of the country are sort of like almost a whim of what, you know, Westminster mm. decides. If you were to say we had that approach and you had, I don't know, a few big parties, a few big areas in the north of England, for example. You're very keen on this. You, well, you might see the rise of like a northern powerhouse party ah. or whatever. All of a sudden. The Northern who, League, like in Italy. Uh, well, yeah, well, okay. Uh, who might get in, <laughs> might get in uh, maybe <laughs> slightly politically different, but they, <laughs> but they, you know, they get enough to say, well, okay, this is what we promised for the north of England and they get representation yeah, yeah. In, in Westminster and we start to shift that balance a little bit. My, well, well, Heinz, let, I mean, let, we've got to draw this pretty close to an end now, but what would you, I mean, if, if someone came to you and said, now what do you think would best fit Britain? 
uh, for Westminster in terms of a change in the current system? What would you say? I would probably say the the New Zealand system. Um, but but the single transferable vote is, is more difficult to sell. On the other end, I, w- I would basically say you... You would need to have a referendum and not on a particular electoral system, but but on whether people want to stick with first past the post or whether they want to switch to a um, more or or fully proportional system. And then it should basically be down. I mean, you, why would you want to necessarily confront people with with what exact particular electoral system they they should should prefer because some are more difficult to understand than others. Mm. Also so for, for New Zealanders, they had a referendum and it worked. They decided we, we do want to retain constituencies, but we want a proportional parliament. Um, and, and they accepted that. And, and I don't necessarily think that British people would, would be opposed well, to that. Well, based on 2011, they didn't. So New Zealand had a, a great example, so that worked for them, but they had another vote, uh, uh, another referendum, uh, which uh, didn't work for them. It was a big uh, deficit, the democratic deficit, in that people were fanatical about getting the Union Jack off the New Zealand flag. <laughs> and so they had a two-stage process, and the first stage was, well, we've got to choose the flag first. Uh, and so people went and voted. So they had five, you know, so they got a whole bunch mocked up and then a, a committee chose two or three, I think. And people voted on the two or three in the first election to arrive at what the flag would be. Then people went to vote saying, well, what do you think? Should we change to this flag or should we stay with the Union Jack? And of course, most people said, no, I don't like this flag. So they, stay they, with the would, they would stick with the Union Jack, even though most people wanted to change the flag. It sounds a bit like Eurovision voting to me. I think <laughs> where you have a jury and then you have the popular vote. That's the system I think I so, get. I mean, there's no perfect well, that's system. The problem, with, the problem with referendums is, is also always what, what kind of question is being asked and, and how it is asked. And, and, and that's that's quite problematic. And but But the main thing for electoral reform would be that you would need one of the major parties come behind it. And that's, of course, the problem now with Labour. They have no incentive to do so, even though a lot of their party members are actually in favour of proportional representation. And in general, I think if, if you look across party members of all the different British parties, you would find a strong majority for uh, proportional representation because party members are also very engaged in politics and, and many of them are in parties and, and suffering under the system and and. Um, it's it's party leaderships yeah, yeah. Who, who are problematic, it, I think, because they see the benefits for them of, of winning. Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. It is all and it is all in the wording, isn't it? When you're right, when you yeah. come to it. so, for example, that that question, uh, what do you think about the idea of leaving all those leeches and bureaucrats in the in European Brussels. Parliament? <laughs> uh, maybe that could have been worded better. Just before we go, <laughs> hey, I don't know if you either of you have watched. It's a very old uh, movie, a Peter Cook movie from the 1970s oh called The Rise and Rise of Michael Rimmer. Have you seen that one, Heinz? It's ages ago. It's ages ago, absolutely. Phil <laughs> is very he, old. But he was, um, he basically allowed people to vote on absolutely everything. And people got, he promised that people would vote that have more say in government. Mm. Everyone voted for him on that basis. Uh, and so he just flooded people with uh, uh, choices. choices for every single decision that had to be made. And in the end, people were so sick of it, he got on TV and said, well, this will be your last vote. You vote as to whether we ever have a vote again. And he basically became a dictator. A, became a dictator. There we well, are. Maybe that's the well, best one suggestion. <laughs> one suggestion I could make is uh, what they what they introduced five, six, seven years ago in India, is you have a none of the above option on the yeah, yeah. ballot paper. <laughs> they would definitely and win, And you I get think. in each election millions of people choosing that. <laughs> exactly. All you need to do is stand as the non above yes. party. In the biggest democracy exactly. in the world. <laughs> Very good, Heinz. Good to talk. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heinz. Excellent. Thank you. Bye. I know we've talked about Australia yeah. a little bit. You, a little? A little, do we want about a little bit? Democratic deficit of 1975 yes. when John Kerr, the Governor General, yeah. basically sacked the government. Ah, yes. yes, yes so, yes. I mean, if, what a shame. Yeah, King Australian Charles. history on this podcast. King, Very important. Of that. I watched and King Charles didn't have the gumption to say, "Well, I'm going to sack the Tory party," and because uh, they're not doing a very good job. Yes, and uh, you know, and we could have. Uh, uh, when see. when is too long? That's the only. I mean, it's another question. We could have talked all day about this. Mm. How long should a term of parliament be? Oh, well. Is five years long enough? Yes, yes, yes. Well, if he, we had a good system, maybe we'd stick with ten. But then you wouldn't want Rishi there for another five years, would you? Well, so. how many elections do we want to get? Oh God, not another election, famously. <laughs> <Is it laughs> that lady, lady from, from Bristol. Bristol. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, we don't want that. We don't want. Oh, right, now we are. 
are done with politics now. Yes, that's We've it had, we had a few weeks of it. I think we all we're need, all going on we, a holiday. We all need a holiday. Yes. Yeah. But where are we going to go? And are we going to upset the local? Will we be welcome? Because yeah. it has to be said, there's a quite a push Tenerife. now back against tourism. Yes, in the Canaries, they uh, there are people protesting against tourism, taking too much of the resources, causing problems for them there. So they the, have to go back to their yeah. to their main business, yeah. which is. Um, <laughs> What? Uh, hang on. Do, do you, um, <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. But I mean, in places like Venice, they're trying to stop people uh, going there in as many numbers, of course. And there's quite a pushback, generally, against the ways in which tourism does dominate certain parts of the world. In, in Japan, they actually put up a screen to stop people taking pictures of Mount Fuji, mm. for example, from a certain place, because yeah. they found it was uh, causing them problems. So I think what we should look at is how we cope with tourism. I mean, do we cope with tourism? Are we a major problem for some parts of the world? Or in fact, bringing them lots and lots of money and income and basically supporting their economy? And there's the whole second home thing as yeah, well. Which, which is, is another like, issue, you know, yeah. It's sort of like Airbnb homes. So there we are. Having made mm. you feel guilty about politics, we're now going to make you feel guilty about your holidays yeah, as well. That's right. You're not going anywhere. Stay at <laughs> home and do with whoever you've just elected. Uh, all right, that's next week. Thanks for listening in today. It's been a fun one. That's the, the Y Cave. We'll see you next week. The Y curve.